Good morning. Welcome everyone once again to our uh, webinar series today is about unusual river cruises in Southeast Asia. Uh, and as I was just saying uh, before, uh, some of these rivers um, I had never heard of before I uh, started getting involved with uh, Panda and our guest today. Um, and so I hope that you'll find uh, some, uh, you'll learn something about some parts of the world that you never thought about traveling to before. Just a couple of quick words for those of you who have not joined one of our Wheel and Anchor webinars. Our mission, our vision is all about bringing travelers together. Um, and so uh, when, when I started Wheel and Anchor a few years back, uh, I, I had traveled with groups to all different parts of the world. And the one thing that I found um, uh, uh, was that whenever you travel with people that you have some kind of a connection to, whether they're close friends or you, know, or you are part of the same social club or something like that, that connection, that like-mindedness um, just means that you have, uh, there's a great synergy, a great chemistry in the group. Uh, and so that's what I thought the premise of Wheel and Anchor was, is to bring like-minded people together um, to have some very unique and fun travel experiences. And my personal goal for everybody is to become well-traveled and well-connected. And I say it every time, well-traveled doesn't just mean checking off boxes on a bucket list. It really means having the opportunity to to learn something, to enrich yourself uh, in, in uh, understanding other cultures and traditions and foods and wine and all that great stuff. And in doing so, becoming connected to not only your fellow travelers, but the other people that you meet along the way. And we make great efforts to try to um, learn something. And it's, uh, it's funny when I see this picture here of on, on the um, uh, Panda ship, um, which uh, looks like it's in, in Myanmar. And I remember such wonderful times traveling uh, because the, the staff there was so friendly and we were all singing together with the, and it felt like a family. And anyway, we'll get into that when we talk a little bit more about the experience on board. Um, I'd like to introduce our team this morning. Um, this, uh, so my name is Gordon, founder of Wheel and Anchor. I'm joined in the background by my colleagues, Joel and Paula, who uh, provide the technical support. And Paula, you might've spoken to on the phone. She is our senior trip specialist. And most importantly, our special guest today, who has been waiting patiently for us to get started. Uh, I'm pleased to announce Sven. He is the gentleman uh, in the little box in the picture. Sven Zika uh, is uh, based in Siem Reap, Cambodia. Uh, he is with Panda. That is the organization we work with who puts on these river cruises. Good, good morning or good evening, Sven. Of course, it's 11 o'clock at night for us. Uh, thanks for yeah. staying. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> and uh, so Sven um, has been around Panda for a number of years. I, I remember uh, he and I met back in London a number of years ago, uh, and uh, we've been um, sort of collaborating on river cruises ever since. So Sven, we look forward to all of your comments about, uh, about these great rivers and about the great experience that, uh, um, that there is on Panda. So our plan today, of course, um, you guys are all about interested in about some unique river cruise itineraries. It's always all about uh, the Danube and the Rhine and the Rhone and you know and, and so on. And but there's so many other rivers that one can uh, voyage down, um, voyage voyage down. And uh, and uh, we're going to talk about a couple of them today. And so I'm going to uh, bet with between Sven and I, we're going to be your guides uh, and we're going to uh, show you a little bit uh, of this part of Asia. Um, we're going to be talking about the Chindwin River in Myanmar, the Brahmaputra in the Assam region of India, and the Red River in Vietnam. Um, so without further ado, let's carry on um, to Southeast Asia. And first of all, I want to talk a little bit about Panda. Um, so uh, Panda is, uh, is effectively a company that was uh, um, started by a gentleman called Paul Strawn. Sven, tell us all about a little bit the history, because there's the differentiator here with Panda is, is that there is actually a lot of history behind mm. this company and the, and the ships. So give us a bit of a synopsis. Yeah, thank you, Gordon. So uh, Panda was started um, 25 years ago. It's a family run, family owned company. The founder, Paul Strachan, is very much still involved. And he used to live in Myanmar. We like to call it Burma, the old name. And he's a Burmese historian. So in uh, 1995, he found an original Irrawaddy flotilla company steamer, the Pandau 1942. He restored the ship and was the first one to offer river cruising on the Irrawaddy and Chinwin rivers 
back in 95. And all our ships, we, had, we have now a replica. So we have 17 ships in five countries in Asia. I will show you a map later on where we operate. And all those ships are built according to the plans of the Irrawaddy Flotilla Company. So it's, everything is um, antique and brass. It's traveling back in time. Uh, we don't want to be a floating, a white, shiny floating resort. We want to be a wooden colonial ship. And then that, that where, we op where we operate, like in Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, India, Myanmar, is a very strong colonial history. And our ships fit perfectly into those countries. And we and built, then, yes? Yeah, okay. we, we built very small ships. Um, so we were starting with 24 and 30 cabins, but all the newer ships have five cabins, 10 or 14 cabins. Yeah. So we see the future in small, very small ship river cruising. So you never get more than 60 people uh, on one trip. Very important point, and 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 what I was about, just about to say there is 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 it's the ambience, and you'll see in a minute as we go through the pictures of the ship, the ambience on board, you know, and 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 I realize that you know the phrase oh it's a step back in time, it sounds like a bit of a cliche, but in this case it really does apply. Um, so looking at the map, Sven, you were telling us about look at all these rivers um, in 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 Asia. Uh, and again, you know, we've, we've heard of the Ganges uh, because, you know, the Ganges is, is, is simply famous, uh, you know, in, in India and, and of course the Mekong in Vietnam and Cambodia and so on. But look at all these other rivers, um, you know, the Irrawaddy, which is a massive river that bisects uh, Burma. Um, the Chindwin, which we're going to be talking about today, is one of its tributaries. Um, the Red River. Um, I, I know one of our members here from Saskatchewan, there's a Red River there too, but obviously we're not talking about that River, Red River today. Um, so there's so many places to explore that are a bit off the beaten track. And, uh, and I'm always so excited because Panda hits so many of them. Um, so good. Well, anyway, let's, let's move right on and talk about our first trip. Um, not just staring about maps. Oh, before we do that, I think... Um, uh, uh, let, let's touch briefly on this slide because uh, you, as I raised the question at the outset about, you know, traveling in the, in the post-COVID era um, and uh, uh, obviously in the travel industry as a whole, there's a tremendous amount of effort going into um, the precautions that, that uh, would be taken. And, uh, you know, Panda, Sven sent me a whole list of things that they're doing. This is a very, very small summary of, of the measures that would be taken um, on board the ship. Um, is there anything in particular that you want to highlight, uh, Sven? I, I don't think we need to go through this in great detail. I mean, the, the point is obviously that you're taking care. Yeah, so the list you see here is pretty much the standard what everybody would do. I must say on the river ships, they have very high level of uh, hygiene and, um, and safety. And there's little things you wouldn't think of, like arriving with luggage from a flight or from a hotel, we would disinfect them, clean them before they go on the ship. Mm. If we have transfers, let's say from the airport or from a hotel to the ship, we wouldn't arrive with 40 people or with 20 people at once. We would stack them so that 10 people arrive at once and then, and then 15 minutes later, another, another, another bus would come. Or things like magazines, books, um, snacks on the ship. Everything which goes through hands for, of guests, everything which is being touched is being removed. So that, yeah, we take very good care about that. Or also to protect local villages. Because in Asia, the virus came from Asia, but that actually came back from, from Europe and the States, or America back to Asia. And I mean, we are still welcome here, but sometimes people are a bit afraid um, and that, in villages, which are very remote, we ask the guests to, to, uh, to wear masks because we don't, we are very close to the villages and we don't want to make them uncomfortable. Exactly. I think it's, I think it's, it's, it's brilliant. I think it's critical. And, and this is one thing that always impressed me with Panda is, is that the way that they, you know, manage the, the, the uh, visitors traveling to the villages is so well done. And I have no doubt that um, extra care would be taken here in, in regards to COVID-19 so that um, we wouldn't risk any exposure for anybody. Um, so anyway, that, that, that addresses that. Thanks. Thanks for that, Sven. Let's talk first of all about the Chinwin. So we've got three rivers to cover today. We wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of them. Um, the Chinwin is a, is a tributary, as I mentioned, of the, of the great Irrawaddy River that pretty much bisects Burma um, and comes uh, out of the Himalayas. Uh, and uh, it's, th this is, and I'm going to say this over and over again, 
you're talking about traveling to where very few people get to. Uh, and so, um, Sven, what this part of, of Myanmar, why? I mean, other than that it's a river <laughs> and you yeah. sail up there, but... <laughs> So it's the second largest river in Myanmar after the Irrawaddy. There's also a very strong connection to the Second World War. So many people um, who have relatives um, or memories, they actually like to visit the area. Mm. It's a very a difficult river to navigate. Um, it's, it's shallow. So you have to have a very small ship with a uh, shallow draft. With a low draft. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, so with our small ships, they have 10 cabins, so we can cruise actually from August until February. There's three kinds of itineraries, depending on the water level. Um, one of the, I would call it maybe the, the best one, because uh, we can reach all the way to Homalin, would be from August to October, maybe if you're lucky, until November. And if you cannot make it uh, all the way to Homalin, we do Moniwa to Kalewa, and Kalewa is north of Mablaik, you see on the map. So maybe half the half the way. It's still going to be a seven night cruise with more stops, but not uh, the big distance all the way to Homalin. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's actually easily accessible. Um, we meet you in Mandalay. It's a two and a half hour transfer to Moniwa. And then we fly you out from Homalin either to Mandalay or Yangon. And so Mandalay is the starting point. And uh, Mandalay is, I think, the second largest city in Myanmar. And in and of itself is an amazing place to visit. And so uh, I would highly recommend, we would in all, in all likelihood spend a few nights here. I've been here a couple of times um, and always found not enough time because whether it's climbing up Mandalay Hill, you can see this amazing picture here of all the pagodas um, that, uh, you know, you, you can of course take a little taxi to the top, but it's much more fun to, to walk up all the steps. You have to do it bare feet. Um, and then you get this incredible view over the plains of the Irrawaddy Valley. Um, so many other great things to see in Mandalay. They've also got this amazing pagoda, which has the largest book in the world that's inscribed on 700 tablets. I love this town. Um, and so it's, it's kind of the gateway for a lot of cruises, uh, a lot of travels period in this part of, uh, of Myanmar. And as Sven pointed out, we start the trip here um, uh, and either travel overland to, to the beginning point or we fly up to, to Homelin. Um, let's talk a little bit about the ship here. So uh, the Zaoji uh, Panda is one of two ships you've got traveling up the Chinwin. Um, what is special and unique about this particular ship and, and in general, because they all have a similar ambiance to them? Mm. So all the ships are very similar, as you mentioned, um, Gordon. I find a story behind the Zaoji Panda quite nice because it used to be a hospital ship, uh, which we donated to an NGO during the Cyclone Nar Nargis in 2008 uh, and after the NGO gave it back to us and we remodeled and rebuilt it to a passenger vessel again. So it's 10 cabins. Um, it's an outdoor experience on a Pandao. So we have outdoor dining. All the meals are on the ship. And if you see it's a shallow draft so we can stop almost anywhere we want. That's quite an adventure. It can't be compared with a European cruise there's no jetties, so we always have to build bridges and stairs and help the guests off the boat. It's quite adventurous. And, and that is really the flavor of it and that differentiates cruising in this part of the world is the fact that, as you saw in that last photo, is the ship like pulls up to the muddy riverbank and they, you know, sort of drop a bridge okay. down. Um, and you and you clamber up, and that's when you really know you're you're not you know th th this this is not a commercial cruise board. <laughs> mm -hmm. And also, you might get dirty, but each time you come back from excursion, the crew you can t take off your shoes, we clean them, and put them back in front of your cabin after each ex uh, excursion. And the, as uh, the the experience, as you said, on Panda is outdoor, and um, if you look at these wonderful lounge areas that there are, and uh, yeah, the front at the back. I mean, obviously there's air conditioned spaces as well, but um, it's really um, it's really the best way um, to to uh, to explore this part of the world because you know the cabins are lovely as you'll see in a moment, but it's all about you know relaxing in these wonderful lounges and um, and and watching the the world go by as you go through. And so you know um, everything is it's all teak, isn't it? Yes. 
Okay. Yeah. So all of the, the cabins are, are done in teak, like you see here. Um, the bathrooms are very um, uh, generous sized. So I, I always say for me, the rule of thumb on any boat is, you know, um, can you bend over in the shower and, and pick up the soap without... <laughs> <laughs> without falling out and yes you can in fact i remember that the panda showers were, were quite large <laughs> larger than i expected um uh, tell us a little bit about the food we we, we saw a, a, a shot there a minute ago of some of the food on board uh, what is the culinary experience in in myanmar and on in, in particular on this cruise so we always have obviously the, the local cuisine we have local chefs on board um, in myanmar it's all burmese um, crew, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, you've got the choice between um, the local cuisine. You're always going to have some Western comfort food. If you like, if you're tired of curries and rice, you can also have a burger or um, fish and chips. Um, and we always, always have a vegetarian option as well. We can cater to, to almost any diet and allergy. Just let us know. Um, that's quite easy in Asia. And it's usually on the ship all the time, actually. Um, it used to be a mix between buffet, a noodle station, a la carte. Obviously, post-COVID, there's going to be no self-serving, so everything's going to be served. And as I mentioned, it's a nice mix of everything and plenty of food, plenty of food. Plenty of food. Yeah, and, yeah. and one of the things that I remember from, from, from traveling on Panda is, is that, you know, as you say, you know, you sit down for your breakfast uh, and you, you can have the traditional bacon and eggs and, and cereal and all those things. But it's, I always say, you got to try the local stuff. And in Myanmar, they have this fish soup. I think it's called Mohinga uh, mm -hmm. that, they, that they serve, which is a traditional dish that they eat at breakfast. And, you know, people are always staring at me like, I can't believe you're eating fish soup for breakfast. I'm like, yeah. you got to try it. Um, but the beauty is, is that you have the opportunity to sample the local stuff and at the same time, um, you know, always default back to those scrambled eggs if you need to. Let's yeah. talk a little bit about a few of the highlights of the river uh, of the Chindwin itself. I mean, again, we're up in remote territory here. So um, what are some of the things that we're going to see, Sven? Would I, um, Joel, could you go back to the map? I think it's easier for, for um, people to understand what I'm talking about and then we do the pictures. There. So the start is in Moniwa um, after we transfer from Mandalay. And Moniwa has the biggest standing Buddha statue. It's actually a building. It's a monastery where the monks pray and actually live. It's like a high-rise building in the shape of a Buddha. Uh, we spent uh, one night in Moniwa, then we continue to Minkin. Minkin is also known as the Luang Prabang of Myanmar. It's full of teak monasteries, a sleepy town, um, quite beautiful. In general, the Chinwin, if you compare it with the Irrawaddy, the Chinwin has a very dramatic scenic landscape. Uh, while on the uh, Irrawaddy you have the cultural highlights like Bagan and Mandalay, you have that you have still a lot of culture on the Chinwin, but it's not the very big one like Bagan and Mandalay. So that's a big bit of a difference. So the Chinwin is perfect for clients who want to have the remote experience or who have been to Myanmar before, who want to see something else. Yeah, or or if you're somebody that is like, oh yeah, you know, everybody goes bang, Bagan to Mandalay, which is not to say that you know one ought to see Bagan in your life, but um, the, for me, the highlight of the experience and and the, and the, the folks that I traveled with in in Myanmar before, it was all about these little villages. And and, and so yeah, go ahead, Sam. So the villages we see, like because there's not much traffic, it, it's hard to get there overland. There's one airport up in uh, Kaleva in Homalane, so it's not really accessible. Not many ships go up there um, because our the, the bigger ships can only go August, September because of water levels. We can do, as I mentioned before, August till February. So when we stop at a village once a week, we we be very welcome. <clears throat> Excuse me, very welcome. So it's not it's not a tourist trap, or they are not used to tourists. They're really um, welcomes it with open arms. So that's quite a nice experience, very authentic. Absolutely, um, and you, you go ahead. And Sittang, uh, actually, is also, if you go back to the, the, the other picture in Sittang, the little village was actually the final resting place of many ships of the Irrawaddy Flotilla Company. So during the colonies, when the Japanese were invading 42, actually the Brits and the Scots sank almost the entire ship, uh, the fleet of the Irrawaddy Flotilla Company. So the Japanese wouldn't take over. And this was one of the final uh, resting um, spots in Sittang. Oh, wow. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, like you, the, the rich, rich history combined with this sort of um, the 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 local life of these villages, and it's you walk in and uh, people. I mean, they, they obviously notice you when you come in because, you know, here you are, you're, you know, this, this, this foreigner that descends on their village, but um, there's none of the um, usual reaction that you get from other places. It's kind of like, at the most, it's like a welcome with open arms, like welcome to our village. A very, very different experience than you'll find in a lot of places. Um, and I guess we get to see elephants here along the way too. Because yeah. elephants are still beasts of burden, if you will, in uh, in Myanmar, they're still used for um, for work purposes. Yeah. Yeah, they are. You have elephant camps and also working camps. Some are retirement camps actually, and some people are still having elephants to um, for logging or for like the deforestation. That's a problem, but they use the the elephants to drag the wood out of the forest. And Kamti is even further north of um, Homalin, the top the top spot we visit, and that's quite famous for uh, gold panning and monasteries as well. And the last picture for the Chinwin are the Naga warriors. So mm. it's a very special itinerary, only we do. And that only happens in September because that's the time when we can even go further up of Homalin, a place called Naga land, very close to the Indian border. And also here, we, we know the village chief it doesn't feel, you know, they make, they make a dance for us, they welcome us. It doesn't feel like a tourist trap, like you would be, I don't know, somewhere <laughs> in Bagan, where they have hundreds of tourists every day. It's really just for us, a group of 15, 20 guests enjoying a private performance um, by those Naga warriors and village chiefs. Yeah, a, 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 an amazing, amazing sight for sure. Um, and so that is uh, up this Nagaland, as, as Sven pointed out, is a special departure. It's probably one that we would aim to do because I think that, that visiting these Naga tribes, which is a very unique um, ethnic group throughout this part of Northwestern Myanmar and in, in the Assam region, um, is just something that you wanna witness if you're going uh, as remote as you are. Um, just to say a couple of words about coming in and out of, of Myanmar, um, Yangon, obviously the capital major city, uh, and in and of itself worth a few days of time. Um, do it, 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 well, there's so many things to see, but in particular, of course, the Shwedagon Pagoda, uh, this, this gold adorned, massive, massive uh, temple in the middle, or the pagoda in the middle of, uh, of the city. Uh, and it really, it, it in and of itself makes it uh, the visit to, to, to Myanmar and to Yangon. Uh, worthwhile. I, I, you know, it's, it's, how, how can you compare it? You can't compare it to anything. It's like the Eiffel Tower of, of, of Yangon. It's an absolute must see. Um, but so many other things in this bustling city, it's kind of reminiscent of Bangkok, you know, 25 or 30 years ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, lots of evolution happening in Myanmar. And Yangon is a, is a great, a great place to get in and out. In and out. So, um, so anyways, we normally do, uh, that gives you a sort of a very short synopsis about what the program, the Chinwin is all about. Um, so we, we will have a little poll. Um, is this the type of thing, type of place you'd be interested in? Um, just take a half a second and, uh, and, and click on your screen. Um, if it's, yeah, sounds interesting. I'd like to see the details um, and, or no, not really my kind of thing. This helps us uh, as we do our programming for uh, 20 for where we're now doing our programming for 2021 or for the end of next year and 2022 um, and beyond. So we always look to our members to say, um, is this the kind of place that you want to go? Um, and depending on the level of interest is, uh, is whether we put it in the programming. So um, let us know your thoughts on that. Um, and uh, once, uh, once you've done um, um, clicking on on one of those two. Uh, no commitment, by the way. Um, if you say yes, you're interested, it doesn't mean we're going to sign you up. Far from it. Um, we uh, again, we just sort of use it to guide our programming. So thank you for that. Let's uh, jump over um, to uh, a little bit to the north and to the west of, of where we just were in uh, in <clears throat> Myanmar, um, and head to the Brahmaputra. So again, I. I I'm going to ask you the question, have you heard of the Brahmaputra before? Um, I'm guessing most of you probably haven't. Uh, I swear until I came and started uh, 
till I met Sven and started working together with Panda, I had not really heard about it either. And I'm a geography buff. But the Brahmaputra is a very significant river, um, which uh, has its origins, has its source up in the Him high up in the Himalayas. Um, it's the ninth um, largest river by, by volume in the world. It is a massive river. It's like 3,000 kilometers long. Um, and it empties out into the, um, into the Indian Ocean in, uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, and uh, so sailing this part of, of India in the Assam region, this is, you know, we all think about India as the triangle that sticks out into the Indian Ocean, but we often forget about um, Assam, which is that, that little extremity, if you will, that's sandwiched in between Bhutan and Bangladesh. Uh, and this river is by far the most important feature um, of, uh, of this part of the world. So, uh, and the Brahmaputra, the, I, I would call this experience almost like a little bit of a safari because you'll see we pass a couple of very significant national parks along the way. So anyway, I'm gonna stop talking and let Sven say, say a few words. Um, first of all, uh, sorry, I'll say one more thing before I let Sven go. <laughs> um, we access this region. There's not many ways to get here. That's one of the things when you travel to these remote regions is how do you get there, right? So uh, Kolkata, fair, formerly known as Calcutta, um, the city of joy is our um, our gateway, our access point to uh, to get into uh, Brahmaputra in the Assam region. Um, and it in and of itself, you know, they call it in India, the city of joy uh, and, and the cultural capital of India has a, a tremendous number of things to visit. This is real India pure, right? I mean, you know, Delhi has uh, got a lot of green and big parks uh, and, and modern buildings and so on and so forth. But Kolkata is India raw. Um, so certainly worth spending uh, some time before or after a trip up into this region. Um, from Kolkata, we then um, hop up to Guwahati where we join the Kindat Panda. And Sven, tell us all about this particular vessel, which again, looks very similar to the last one, but obviously it's different because we're in India. Yeah, <laughs> thanks Gordon. Well, the Kindat Panda was actually built in Myanmar. We have three ships in India and all of them were built in Myanmar and actually shipped over tugging boat um, to Kolkata, the Ganges and Brahmaputra rivers. This ship has 18 cabins and is very similar to the Zorji Panda you saw before, just a bit bigger, maximum of 36 passengers. All cabins are the same size, um, 16 square meters can be double, twin or single. And also here is the outdoor experience. So we have outdoor dining, we can also have indoor dining, it's both possibilities and a beautiful observation deck we can enjoy the um, landscape. The Brahmaputra is a very wide, very large river and it's changing every season. There's new sand banks, new islands, then river banks moving. It's quite interesting to see um, the villages, how they always have to move uh, depending on the water flow every season. And on the Brahmaputra, so on this itinerary, obviously we're not gonna have Burmese food, we're going to have Indian food. Is there anything about the style of cuisine there? Because I know some people think, oh, Indian food, it's gonna be like super spicy or something like that. Um, how, how could you summarize what the, what the food is like? Well, I think Indian cuisine is the best in the world, personally. Um, <laughs> and you have I a like it Indian, <laughs> Indian crew on board, an Indian chef, so chef, I mean, they're not gonna, kill you with the spices, they know how to, how to cook. And um, always if guests are asking for extra spicy or no spicy, I mean, the waiters and the, the chefs remember. It was very easy in the beginning, we check with the guests how they want to have it. And usually it's mostly curries, obviously, uh, naan bread. And then again, you can have your Western delights if you want to have fish and chips or spaghetti bolognese, that's also possible. I mean, that's quite flexible on a yeah. that. And, and uh, uh, the food quality is, is really first class, um, mm. but it, it is the diversity. The fact that you've always got to fall back if you really just don't want to, can't bring yourself to try it, to try that particular curry of the day. But the point is, is that you have the opportunity to try and, and Panda does it, uh, you know, these guys do it, do it um, amazingly. So good, let's jump over to the Brahmaputra. You see a tiger here. If we're really, really lucky, we'll see one, but I mean, they are right, yeah, quite elusive creatures, right? It is um, rare, yeah. Well, it's, it's very, as you mentioned at the beginning, it's all about um, safari. Um, Joel, if you could see the map again from the beginning, Brahmaputra, so yes, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Um, 
So yeah, Guwahati, uh, as Gordon mentioned, accessible via Kolkata, also has the um, flights to Delhi and Bhutan. So we meet in Guwahati, and this is a seven night itinerary going up Tespur and turning around and coming back to Guwahati. Highlights would be the national parks. You're going to see the Nameri National Park, and we're going to take small flo uh, floats, like little small boats for two hours on a smaller river through the national park. And you're going to see the range of the Himalayas. It's a stunning view in a distance, um, quite dramatic. It's fam this national park, Nameri, is famous for bird watching, especially hornbills and wild elephants. Next highlight will be the Kaziranga National Park um, with a lot of rhinos. The one horned rhino is, um, is there. Then the water buffaloes, elephants. And there we're going to see tigers if we are lucky. It's very rare. Yeah, tigers are tough. I've been to India a couple of times and uh, tigers are, are, are very tough to see. But, but you still get to see a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of other animals that you don't necessarily uh, associate with India, uh, you know, like the rhinoceros and so on. You think of a lot of these animals are, are sort of endemic to Africa, um, but you can, you can really see a tremendous amount in, in, uh, in Kaziranga. It is, uh, I think this park um, was, was sort of put on the map, if you will, when, uh, when uh, William and, and Kate, yes. the, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, went there a few years back and, uh, uh, and, and sort of all of a sudden opened up the world's eyes to, uh, to this part of, of the world and this part of India. Uh, and uh, so. So Kaziranga would be a beach, uh, sorry, a Jeep safari. Nameri would be with boat and walk. And obviously with professional rangers following our group. Yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. Assam is also the biggest tea uh, producer in India. And we're gonna see um, tea plantations plantation homes, you're going to see the production and we're going to have tea tasting as well included. And, you know, Assam is obviously for tea lovers is, you know, one of the most significant regions in the world because I guess they have an optimal climate there for growing that particular kind of, you know, malty um, black tea that, you know, for, for tea lovers, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a huge tea lover to know the difference between all the different kinds, but um, talking to my tea lover friends, they're like, Assam, that's, that's the real deal. Um, and, and seeing the tea plantations, I haven't been to this part of India, but I have seen them in Sri Lanka and in, in Kerala in the southern part. Um, there's something magical about the, how incredibly well manicured these hundreds of acres of, of tea plantations are. It's, it's a remarkable thing to witness. So um, there's a ton to see along the Brahmaputra. The river itself, as Sven pointed out, is massive. In the wet season, it, it spans as much as 25 kilometers wide. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you know, can hardly see from one side to the other. Uh, and uh, with the Himalayas in the backdrop, um, it just makes it an incredible, incredible experience for somebody that's looking for a cruise. And an experience in India that is not the India that you expect. I mean, you know, like I, I, I always say, one should see the Golden Triangle and the, you know, Rajasthan, the usual parts of India. But if you want to experience India that to most, the vast majority of tourists don't get to see, that's the place to go. So the cruise itself is seven nights. We would in all likelihood tack on another seven nights to visit Bhutan. Um, so Bhutan, of course, is uh, the kingdom that is just to the north of India and Assam. Uh, and, uh, you know, it has a couple of claim to fames, but, you know, in the last few years, they, you know, uh, the, the UN always talks about it being the happiest people in the world because they have their gross national happiness index, um, which uh, I, I think there's maybe some controversy around that, um, but I haven't been to Bhutan. It's been on my bucket list for a long, long time. But what I do know is, is that um, they, they limit the number of tourists that come in largely by actually charging a minimum daily fee uh, for your lodging and your meals and your guiding and so on and so forth. Um, and they take great care to protect the environment and protect these incredible um, mountainous and forest landscapes. I read a statistic in National Geographic not that long ago saying that the government mandates that 60% of the country must be covered by forests at all times. It's like 
you know, how fantastic that they are so, you know, environmentally sensitive and aware. Um, and they also pre uh, preserve these wonderful traditions, obviously, uh, being a Buddhist uh, country, a Buddhist kingdom, um, and, and these phenomenal temples like you see here, the Tiger's Nest Monastery is probably the, the postcard, if you will, from Bhutan. Um, and this is the type of scenery that you see. So we would probably spend about a week here, largely in and around Timpu, which is the capital. Uh, and uh, we can fly, as Sven mentioned from there, from Guwahati, probably via Kolkata, perhaps direct. It all depends uh, up to uh, up to Paro and, and, and visit really the interior of this wonderful country of Bhutan. So quite a combination to take Assam and Bhutan all into one trip. Um, and and uh, that's kind of what it would be all about. So um, once again, give us your thoughts on, uh, on, on this program. What do you think about Assam region and, and the Brahmaputra River? Is this something that you would consider to be on your bucket list. It probably wasn't there before. Um, most of these are probably not on most people's list. Um, and, but I'm curious, uh, is it the type of thing that sounds interesting to you? Would you like to see more details if, we, if and when we put this program together? I'm fairly confident we will um, because uh, when, we, when I presented this a couple of years ago, um, I did have quite a number of people that were interested in seeing a different part of NTS, India. So um, yeah, so take a minute, click, click on your screen. Is it interesting or no, it's not interesting. I won't hold it against you one way or the other. Um, as I say, it just helps us with our planning. So uh, I will uh, get ready to uh, jump into our final river for today. Uh, we're gonna zip uh, a couple thousand kilometers to the east. Um, and head over to Vietnam, um, where we're going to look at the Red River. Uh, and this is another very interesting, uh, very unique trip. Um, well, let's get into it in a little bit more detail with the map. Sven, take us through the, the overview of where we're going on, on, on the Red River. We're going to talk about the downstream, uh, obviously, itinerary, so beginning up at Hua Bin. Okay. The whole story behind the Red River, like I haven't heard of the Red River before myself, um, and our founder, Paul Strachan, is very much a pioneer and he was like exploring where can we go, what else is out there. So we were starting this as the first operator in 2015 and we're still the only one operating on this river. So the same ship can go in the Red River and the Delta and also in the Bay of Halong. So we're operating this since five years now. We are starting in Hua Bin. Hua Bin um, has a also very strong war history, but not the Second World War, an older war between uh, French and um, Vietnamese. We, it's very scenic up there. And you're gonna have a lot of ethnic minor minorities along the, the, the Da River and Red River. So we cruise, I wanna mention something uh, with the water itinerary. So we have the high water itinerary, which you saw in summer and the low water itinerary in winter. So if you are worried might be too hot for you in Asia, mm -hmm. then pick Northern Vietnam in winter, like December to February, we're talking 16 to 20 degrees. It's not freezing, it's just nice and warm for us, <laughs> but uh, it is uh, rather cooler for Asia. It's not in the 30s or 35. So that's the winter um, in Northern Vietnam. Same also applies for actually for the Chin Nguyen and Laos, all those Northern countries are much cooler between December and February. I think we'll definitely go in the winter months because I know it can be really steamy in the summertime. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. In that part of Vietnam. Whoa. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. Um, we'll talk briefly about the ship. Sorry, uh, before we go back to the itinerary. Uh, once again, the a Panda ship, a classic. <laughs> you could see everybody gather around for one of the lectures. Um, the Angkor Panda, Panda uh, how, what, what, what makes this one a little bit different or, or special for the Red River? Well, the Anchor Panda is also a small ship, 16 cabins. Uh, she used to cruise on the Mekong. That's why the name Anchor Panda. Mm -hmm. And then we moved her up to the Red River. We have a closed dining room here because it can get quite chilly in the evening sometimes in, in winter. But you have the middle is open. There's this observa observation desk you see here where people actually read a book, um, have cocktail hour or just enjoy the view. 
And again, it's very similar to the other ships in terms of cabins, the size, amenities. It's a safe service, the same, the same um, standard on each of, our, of the Panda ships. Exactly. So our trip along the Red River, as we mentioned, will start up in the highlands uh, of Vietnam, up in um, Hua Bin. And actually, at this point, we're not even on the Red River, right? This is the actually the Da River, I think. The Da River, yeah, yeah. It's changing the name all the time, actually. <laughs> just like <laughs> Easier to call the Red River because it does change. Each section has a different name. But so you wake whole... up in the morning, you read your program. What river are we on today? <laughs> well, I was talking about how I've been very scenic, obviously, on the Da River. Um, there's also a famous national park called Ba Vi National Park. Uh, lots of minority groups. We see museums um, along the way. And one of the highlights would be Hanoi, where we spent two nights, where we also have a walk to the old quarter. We saw the Ho Chi Minh mausoleum. We um, see the famous um, Hanoi Hilton, which is actually a prison during the Vietnam, American Vietnamese war. And lots of small vill villages along the way. Like we saw the other picture with the pottery and, and ceramics. There's a village which, which does only bonsai. So we learn about that, bonsai trees. And one thing I really liked, there was a village famous for water puppets. So it's quite a big thing, especially in Northern Vietnam. The big water puppet theaters in Hanoi, where there's like 150 or 200 people watching this. But again, on a on, on a cruise with us, we we stop out of Hanoi in a small village, where they actually produce, like by hand, um, those water puppets, and they do a private show in a pond, for us only. So only for the panda guests um, outside of the tent. That's quite special as well. And that's part of the beauty of visiting these smaller towns is because, mm. uh, again, I mean, Hanoi, obviously, you know, a lot of people visit Hanoi uh, from, from, well, from all over the world, but in particular from parts of Asia. But when you're up in the Vietnamese highlands um, in Duong Lam and uh, in, in Hua Bin and so on, I guess you're hardly seeing any other tourists. No, then in Hua Bin, you could see other tourists, yeah, but the small village is really rare, yeah. Yeah, and so that is the part of this trip is, so this, this, this cruise, by the way, is 10 nights from Hua Bin all the way out to Halong Bay. Uh, and so we spent, uh, you know, a good half of the trip, I guess, you know, up cruising in, in these remote parts of Vietnam, once again, exploring the, the way of life of um, in, in Vietnam and in, you know, in the rural part and the rice paddies and some of the scenes that you can imagine in your own mind. Um, but at the same time, uh, having the chance to e explore and experience that openness that you get when you go into villages that aren't, you know, overwhelmed by tourists sort of every day, every day of the week. And that, that's what I find is, is the experience here. Um, of course, for me, the highlight of, of, of all of Vietnam, I think, uh, is, is I'll never forget when I first went to Ha Long Bay, which is uh, almost 25 years ago, um, uh, the end of our cruise, uh, again, assuming we are doing the downstream run, comes out in this incredible, incredible bay. Um, uh, what's your own experience of, of Ha Long Bay, Sven? I've been there twice and it's, it's beautiful, it's stunning. Um... The sunrises, the sunsets, the limestone, it doesn't, it doesn't get boring. We spent two nights there, it doesn't get tiring. Um, we have, we see bigger islands in the bay, we see small villages, floating villages. We go um, paddle boating, similar to this you see on, on, those, on this photo, they take us into caves. We can also do kayaking and cycling. So we have uh, bicycles on the ship, so for the more active people um, on the bigger islands, we can do that. We see farms, fishermen. So it's quite, it's, it's not only this, the limestone hills, there's beautiful beaches where we have a picnic, where we even go, go for a swim. So I went for a swim, it's, it's pretty clean. Um, so it's quite a stunning area. And I could stay three or four nights. I think two nights is almost not enough. It's just beautiful, stunning, yeah. And one interesting fact for, fact for you, all the ships are white painted, that's the law, if the ship is registered in the north. But because the anchor panda is registered in the south, in Saigon, we don't have to follow this rule. So we actually almost the only brown wooden ship up in Halong Bay, and that legally. Everybody else has to be white.
<laughs> oh wow so that's so you can you can see the ship from afar just because it looks yeah. so different and yeah I my own experience and how long is is all of that and I remember you can't see it so much in this picture but you know the water has this this light blue color you know that contrasted against the mountains that rise up and then you see these little fishing boats coming along you know selling fruits and vegetables and it truly is like life on the water it all sort of happens there and mm -hmm. Uh, it, it's it's one of the most memorable trips I, I can recall ever taking in Southeast Asia. I'm a big fan of Halong Bay. Uh, and yeah, as I say, when we get to the programming, you make a good point. Um, well, we're on the ship for two nights, which is great because we get to sort of cruise around and enjoy the wonderful amenities of the ship. We might even stay on for a couple of nights um, in Halong Bay because it is so special and it's worth um, it's worth spending every minute of the time because, you know, you probably won't go back, although I'm dying to go back there. Um, we would uh, we would conclude a trip uh, into Vietnam by visiting some of the other important sites um, of the country, in particular, uh, for example, Hue, which is a university town on the uh, strangely named Perfume River. Um, but, uh, you know, between Hue and Hoi An, uh, which uh, which is uh, nearby in the central part of Vietnam. Uh, once again, you know these these are certainly more frequented towns by by visitors, but because of the you know the rich history and the, again the experience of being being on these rivers that empty out into the uh, into the Sea of I think believe it's the Sea of uh, South China Sea is already at this point. Um, you really get this this flavor of, uh, of of Vietnam so um, great stops that we would do on the way down and we would culminate the trip undoubtedly in Ho Chi Minh City one of my favorite cities in Southeast Asia uh, and uh, you know again I I, re I remember Ho Chi Minh City from 25 years ago when everybody was driving bicycles um, and nowadays it's all motorbikes and taxis and it looks it looks a little bit more like a bustling Southeast Asian city that you would accept that you would expect um, but Ho Chi Minh being on uh, towards the, the lower part of the, of the Mekong River um, and uh, has its own sort of flair and charm and lots of amazing markets. Um, and of course, um, remnants from the Vietnam War, in particular, these uh, Coochie Tunnels, um, which is a must see. And you, you can see how the, uh, the, the Vietnamese played their smaller physical size to their advantage because they were able to build this incredible network of tunnels um, all around. Uh, there's hundreds of kilometers of them outside of Ho Chi Minh City, and and with that they were able to um, to to overcome the um, the onslaught of the uh, the the American troops. So fascinating history in Vietnam, um, and uh, this on this trip we cover a lot of it from you know remote villages in the north all the way down to um, to Ho Chi Minh City in the south. So um, let us know what you think. Is uh, the Red River, is that the kind of place that, yeah, would that uh, pique your fancy? Is that the thing, type of a river cruise that you'd want to go on? Um, we'd, we'd love to know. Um, I'm quite inclined to, I'm, I, I, will, I would like to, to offer all these to our members, um, largely because um, these are smaller vessels. I mean, the one here, the Ankar Pond, Pandaw is a little bit, a little bit larger with, it's about what, 100 passengers on board? Or 80, sorry, here. This one, 16 cabins. 16, oh, sorry, 16. So it's only 32 people, there you go. So I was thinking about the ones in the Irrawaddy. So there you go. So we could just do a pr practically a wheel and anchor only group um, on that and have the whole ship to ourselves, And that would be uh, an amazing experience. And that's part of what I like about these kind of programs is, is that um, not only are the rivers remote, but the groups are small because the ships are small. So you get a, a very, very different experience than on traditional river cruising. So if you think it's interesting, uh, click on the button. I uh, hope you did that already. Um, before we get into the question and answer session, and I see a few questions have already come in. Um, tell us, uh, sorry, um, uh, coming up week after next, we'll have um, part three of our incredible rail journeys. We're going to be looking at uh, the Indian Pacific Railway in Australia, as well as the Gone, so two transcontinental railway journeys, uh, and so uh, do join us for that. Uh, Paula has just uh, posted the link to register for that in case you're interested, and you'll find it in our uh, Saturday newsletter as well, um, so that's coming up on December the 9th, uh, and uh, uh, of course, if you have questions about this, uh, now is the time to answer them if you want a, a, a quick and instant answer from the horse's mouth, because while we have Sven with us, um, please do pose uh, your questions. Uh, and. Uh
Otherwise, you're always welcome to call us or email us. Um, so I see a couple of questions here. First question uh, from Alina, what uh, tribes would we meet in Northern Vietnam? Um, uh, Sven, do you, do you know the names of, of some of the tribes? I recall yeah. seeing when I was going through the details myself, but... Uh, the biggest one would be the Hmong ethnic group, M-U-O-N-G, that's the biggest ethnic oh, group. Oh, yeah, the Hmong, yeah, which is quite a, quite a famous ethnic group that, uh, um, from that region. But as I understand it, there are multiple groups that reside all through Vietnam and that sort of spread over the border into, uh, into China, into Laos, and so on and so yes. forth. Yes, I can't name you, name you them right now, but uh, there are multiple <laughs> ethnic groups up there, yeah. <laughs> I haven't studied all of them yet. Um, Pete asked the question, what's the biggest difference between the Irrawaddy and the Chindwin? I mean, obviously the Chindwin is a tributary, but from the experience standpoint, well, the Chinamen is much more scenic. As I mentioned, it's, it's like very hilly. There are mountains, forests. It's a beautiful, dramatic, dramatic landscape. While the mm -hmm. Irrawaddy, the lower Irrawaddy, is a bit flat. It has the cultural highlights of Bagan and Mandalay. The upper Irrawaddy um, is also more hilly and more dramatic landscape. So you can compare the upper Irrawaddy and the Chinamen a little bit together, and the lower Irrawaddy from Mandalay down, down is a bit more flat. Yeah, okay, yeah, perfect. Yeah, and I recall that as well. The further north that you go uh, is, obviously you're getting into the, 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 the foothills of the, of the high mountains where these rivers uh, source from. Um, and you almost see no tourists. I mean, that's also an experience. You don't see any tourists, like very rarely yeah, up there. So that's really yeah. an ex expedition feeling. Yeah. Exactly. Um, uh, Troy wanted. Troy. Troy said he wanted to qualify. Did you say January, February for the Red River? Is that the time of the year uh, or the opt? It goes kind of all year round. You operate the trips there, but uh, um, January, February is a good time to go. Well, it depends what you want. If you like, you don't want to have it too hot, then January, February would be good. It can be foggy at that time, and it's a lower water itinerary, so we cannot reach Hawaii all the way. That really depends um, what you want. September, okay. September, October is also quite good. It can get it can get rain, so it's a bit of a mix. Yeah, exactly. Well, this is always the challenge that we have: is, yeah. is that you know one season is good for one aspect of the trip, the other season is got so there's pros and cons always. Um, but I would say that we would probably go in the latter part of the fall, sort of October, November. The weather That's is cooler, yeah. but not so warm. Um, and, uh, but you then avoid the, 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 the mistiness that you get from really the winter months. Mm -hmm. um, Alina asked again, do we go to the Sapa area, area of Vietnam? And I'm actually I'm not familiar with the Sapa area. Do you, does that I've yeah, been there. It's not part of the cruise, but it would be easy to add on. But you could, uh, if you do, um, you could actually have this from Vietri or Hoa Bin and transfer up to Sapa and then take the night train when you finished visiting Sapa, the night train back to Hanoi. So it's quite an easy add on before or after the cruise and connects very well with Hanoi. Okay, perfect. So, yeah, and this is, I guess, where the hill tribes are. So, this is. It's yes. optimal for kind of trekking and that kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. so Alina, that 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 might be the kind of thing that we could um, organize if you wanted to do, um, um, you know, a little add-on extension or a pre-tour for that matter, um, up into that area. So, um, yeah, fantastic. Um, good. I think we're through all the questions. Um, so good. If you do have anything else, please do um, um, drop us an email. Uh, and uh, if I can't answer the question, I know where to reach Sven, uh, and uh, I'm sure he'll be able to help us out. Thank you so much, Sven, for taking the time uh, late this evening, coming up to midnight here in Asia, uh, and uh, for giving us a little bit of a flavor on what we could expect on these wonderful uh, Pandaw River cruises in, uh, in um, Myanmar, in the Assam region of India and Vietnam, and uh, hope to catch up with you again soon. Thanks for having me and thanks everybody for joining. All right. Thanks for everybody. And uh, I look forward to catching you up, up with you on our next webinar um, in uh, uh, a week and a half's time. So have a great day.